for helping us keep the conversation aloft here at Town Hall. Our program tonight originates on Crowdcast, but if you'd like to view with closed captioning, proceed to YouTube. Where you can enable real-time captions through the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Um, tonight's presentation all around will last around an hour. After, um, after their discussion, Saru and Ross will parry your questions. Please submit your questions using the Ask a Question button bottom center on the Crowdcast pane. Although we cannot guarantee they'll be able to address every question, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Town Hall adds new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include Anthony Townsend on the future of driverless cars, Vivian Lee on strategies for solving America's healthcare crisis, Annabelle Abbs with her compelling fictional biography of Lucia Joyce, as well as our annual Engage UW Science series of reports directly from UW Labs, and still more installments of Earshot Jazz Live from the forum. Meanwhile, you'll find many past events available in our digital media library, which is kind of a memory hole for life as it used to be, you know, back in February. All this work is made possible and made accessible to the broader community through individual and institutional donors. Civics programming in particular is courtesy of the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. And finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching tonight. Actually, not so finally, two more points. Um, with the many recent event cancellations at Town Hall, like other nonprofits, we're facing significant financial strain. And if you made a donation on the way into the live stream tonight, thank you very much. We hope you will all consider supporting us during this time by using the donate button at the bottom of your screen or by becoming a member on our website. One final point of economic data. Our partner booksellers have been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak and could use your support as well. Tonight's event around Bite Back will likely only inspire more interest in these issues so if you're interested in supporting local independent booksellers by purchasing a copy of the book and going deeper, of course, on the issues, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through third place books. All right, then. Saru Jayaraman is president of One Fair Wage, co-founder and president of the Restaurant Opportunity Centers United and director of the Food Labor Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. After 9-11, together with displaced World Trade Center workers, she co-founded The Rock which is now, uh, now has more than 18,000 worker members, 200 employer partners, and several thousand consumer members across the country, a dozen states. Uh, J.R. Amin was named a champion of change by the Obama administration in 2014, listed in CNN's top 10 visionary women, and awarded a James Beard Foundation Leadership Award in 2015. In 2018, she was chosen by the National Women's History Project as one of its honorees for Women's History Month in the United States. She is the author of two books, uh, I should say three now. Uh, previous books include Behind the Kitchen Door from 2013 and 2016, Forked, A New Standard for American Dining. Ross Reynolds is KUOW's executive producer for community engagement. Before that, he was the KUOW program host for 16 years. Uh, his awards uh, include the 2011 Public Radio News Director's First Place in Call-In categories, and he had been, previously been KUOW's News Director and Program Director and served in similar roles for KBOO Portland and KCUW in Worcester, Massachusetts. J.R. Amund's book, Bite Back, People Taking on Corporate Food and Winning, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Ross Reynolds and Saru J.R. Amund. Well, yeah, thanks very much for that introduction. Um, Saro, great pleasure to talk to you this evening. Uh, uh, thank a topic you. which I'm extremely interested in, going back to my days as a dishwasher in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, in the current crisis, we're hearing a lot of restaurants are not going to be reopening. They're going to be closing. They're, there are apt to be fewer restaurants in the future. And as we spoke about this beforehand, obviously this offers some opportunities, but it also has a big downside to it. I wonder if you could start by talking about the impact you're hearing from restaurant workers about how this crisis is affecting them now, and then maybe transfer over to some things that could good that could come out of this. Sure. I think in talking about the crisis now, it's super important for listeners to understand the crisis that existed prior to the pandemic in our industry. So the restaurant industry was, prior to the pandemic, the nation's second largest and absolute fastest growing private sector employer, 13.5 million workers. That's one in 10 American workers currently working in restaurants, one in two Americans having worked in the industry at some point in their lifetime. You are already proving the one in two. <laughs> um, and I'm sure many of the viewers also worked in the industry. It's so huge, and, it, and most of us have worked in it. 
And yet, despite the industry's size and growth, and the fact, by the way, um, that it just has continued to grow during every other economic recession of the last 100 years. In fact, we became the only nation on earth a few years ago in which we are we were spending more money on food eaten outside of the home than we were on food eaten inside of the home. So huge industry, and yet, despite its size and growth, the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States largely because of the money, power, and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association, which we call the other NRA, represents the chains, the IHOPs, the Applebee's, the Olive Gardens. And in doing research for our last book, uh, Forked, we uncovered that the other NRA has been around since emancipation of slavery when it first demanded the right to hire newly freed slaves, not pay them anything at all, and have them live entirely on tips. Tipping had originated in feudal Europe, it was something that aristocrats in feudal Europe gave to serfs and vassals, but always on top of a wage. When it came to the states, it was mutated into a replacement for a wage rather than an extra or bonus on top of a wage because of slavery, because of the National Restaurant Association's demand to hire these newly freed slaves. So we went from a zero dollar wage at emancipation all the way up to a two dollar and 13 cent federal minimum wage for tipped workers in 2020. And uh, and that was the crisis that, you know, 10, 13 million workers were already facing in the United States. They were earning wages in most states, 43 states, between two and five dollars an hour. Um, they were mostly women, 70 percent women, 40 percent single mothers, disproportionately women of color surviving off of tips. We called them living tip to mouth. They maybe went to the restaurant to eat themselves but then they got the tips to feed their kids. That's how they fed their kids. And so they were very vulnerable to sexual harassment. In fact, they have the highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry because they're entirely reliant on the whims and vagaries and biases of customers. That was the situation prior to the pandemic. People were barely eking by. And with restaurants closing, we look at, I, we always call it Friday the 13th, March 13th was D-Day in our industry in a lot of, especially the coastal states. Um, we went from the nation's largest industry to 10 million workers being out of work pretty quickly. So uh, with those workers being- Do you have any sense of how many of them will come back? I mean, a, a, a lot yeah. of these jobs are just gone forever. These people That's will right. not I, I'm estimating about 30% of restaurants may not come back and that means 30% of 10 million. So you're looking at three to 4 million people being long-term unemployed, not unemployed for six months or a year, but long-term unemployed. And even for those that will go back, they are facing just uh, Great Depression era levels of poverty, star starvation, and crisis because our estimates are that about 60% of that 10 million are having real trouble accessing unemployment insurance. And it's largely because that sub minimum wage plus tips is not enough. They're being told by their state governments that sub minimum wage of two or three or four dollars, whatever it is in their state, plus tips is not enough to meet the minimum threshold to qualify for unemployment insurance. Now, yes, Washington state is not one of those 43 states. Washington state is one of the seven states that got rid of the sub minimum wage many years ago, but it doesn't mean that restaurant workers aren't still the lowest paid workers in Washington state and also that they're still pretty reliant on tips, which still has made them subject to some very uh, difficult situations, particularly because our industry is so racially segregated, communities of color tend to be in more casual restaurants, fast food restaurants, casual restaurants, where tips are more likely to be in cash. And so when they go to apply for unemployment, even in Washington state, if they've had cash tips, they're gonna have a harder time than a worker in a fine dining restaurant reporting everything that they earned and getting unemployment insurance based on everything that they earned. So, People are in a really precarious situation, but it's important to understand they were in a very precarious situation prior to the pandemic. And now the levels of unemployment and lack of access to benefits are just rapidly expanding that to, like I said, Great Depression era levels of poverty and starvation. 
and much higher levels of poverty and starvation among communities of color in particular. Well, the, there's the saying, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, are right. there? Uh, let's talk about the flip side of that. Yes, it's going to be a lot of dislocation. A lot of those people aren't returning to work. But in this time, is there the ability for improvement for movement? Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, over the last two months, I have to say, I've never seen both so much devastation and so much possibility for transformation. I think this is the moment of the most possibility for most radical transformation in our industry in the history of the United States of America, in the history of this industry existing in the United States of America, because, um, I mean, there's several reasons. One is when you've got 10 million people out of work and most of them are being told by the government, you earn too little to qualify for benefits that you pay taxes for, people are gonna be very angry. A light bulb is going off when the government's telling you you earn too little. A light bulb is going off for hundreds of thousands of workers, maybe I earn too little. And maybe I shouldn't go back to work until I'm actually paid an, a livable wage, something that I can actually survive on. We're hearing from lots of workers in many states, you know, tips are way down right now. I would estimate tips are down between 50 and 75% because people don't tip as much uh, when they're not eating in, they're not tipping as much with delivery and takeout, and restaurants, even when they reopen for in, in restaurant dining, are not gonna be able to accommodate the same number of people, so tips are way down. Yeah, by and the way, if you're, if you're doing takeout, add a tip. I mean, some restaurants Absolutely. are saying, would you like to add a tip, but don't wait to be asked, if you're doing takeout, say add 20% onto it if you can afford that. Absolutely tip, uh, and, Let's support these workers who are saying, never again will I survive exclusively on tips because tips are way down. Pay me a livable wage. Are, are they in a situation, though, where they can hold out? I mean, given the fact that many of them may be unemployed for quite a while, do they, is there, how can they, they have no leverage. There are so many of them that won't get good offer jobs at all. So, I, I actually think they do have leverage okay. because uh, because I think right now there's been a moment where consumers have woken up to the essential nature of some of these workers and the fact that they don't want to patronize restaurants where they feel unsafe. So the workers have tremendous power to organize and say to the employer, we don't want to come back collectively until you make this a safe and stable working environment. And it, and we have the power to tell the public as the workers that this is not a safe and stable working environment. So I actually think they have tremendous leverage right now because there's been a, a reckoning with the fact that when the poorest among us is sick, it affects all of us. That's what a pandemic teaches you. You can't just ignore large swaths of the population that have never been able to take care of themselves. We're not taking care of them. They're not given the means to take care of themselves. That impacts all of us. So if you're um, right, and, and these workers do have leverage and they can maybe return uh, with better circumstances, explain how they exercise that leverage and what they yeah. might be asking for, how they might want to change things. Yeah. So uh, we are actually gearing up for national strikes, national actions where workers will be uh, demanding that uh, they not go, they not be forced to go back until they get what they need to keep themselves safe and the public safe, and that includes livable wages. But I, I have to say, they're not alone in this in the way that they might have been in the past. The other incredible new opening is the way in which employers, hundreds and hundreds of employers are coming to us, some of whom fought us in the past and are saying, we actually are aligned with you. We think this is a moment of reinvention for restaurants in general, and we believe in a totally new future, one that's more equitable and sustainable for all of us. So we had a meeting uh, two weeks ago with Institute for the Future here in the Bay Area with some of the nation's top restaurant owners, some from Seattle, and uh, everybody was thinking about how to totally reinvent everything, wage and compensation structures, um, revenue models, even how they're serving, where they're serving, how they reach markets, 
People are talking about home meal kits. You know, everything is, is open for reinvention. Give some examples of how those things would advantage workers that are coming from a place where they were very disadvantaged. Give, it, yeah. give some concrete sales. And also be curious to know which Seattle restaurateurs you're talking to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, we've been talking to Renee Erickson in Seattle, who's definitely looking at uh, you know reinvention in terms of how her restaurants operate and delivery and but also in terms of equitable tip and wage models she's looking at all different kinds of possibilities um, but nationally I, I have to say I, I, like very clear examples employers who funded the National Restaurant Association to fight us on wage increases are now coming to us and saying we're going to increase our wages we're going to increase our wages the time has come we're having to reinvent our re business model anyway we might as well do it right why are they doing it now it's three reasons one they are seeing they saw what we saw they are seeing workers devastated across this country they are seeing the fact that this system of forcing a majority of workers to live off of tips was not sustainable or tenable to begin with Two, they genuinely are starting from scratch. They genuinely are thinking about totally reinventing everything about themselves from how they compete with one another, how they explain to customers who they are and the product and the meal price, how they pay people and how tips are part of that. They're reinventing everything. And so that reinvention allows for um, new wage and tip models. And the third reason, is that there is consumer demand for change. I mean, polling is showing it. Um, there is massive consumer demand for change. We just did a national poll with the Justice Collaborative that showed that about 80% of voters and consumers are saying the moment is calling for a new economy, a new way of paying people. It's calling for 50. People are saying we are much more supportive of people being paid a full livable wage now than we were before the pandemic. And so that's why I say, I think workers have more leverage than they did in the past, partly because you've got a lot of great employers who are really kind of getting aligned, but also because you have thousands of consumers who are saying, we wanna see something different. We need to see something different. And in order to make us leave our homes and we've learned that we can cook at home. Wow, <laughs> what's gonna make us go back to eat out? We need to see something different. And, and what will that difference be? I mean, when it comes to the way that restaurants will look in the future, I mean, you've seen pictures of plexiglass things surrounding diners uh, in, in couples, and it looks like something out of the Jetsons, but how will restaurants be different when they do begin to reopen? Yeah, a lot of what restaurants are talking about, I know this conversation's happening in Seattle, it's happening in pretty much every urban area, is public space. Um, can you extend the restaurant beyond the four walls of the restaurant? Can you have sidewalk, sidewalk cafes and closed streets and, you know, have common, have public space? And I think there are a lot of advantages to that that extend beyond the restaurant industry. You know, the, the real beauty of the restaurant industry is the way in which we as Americans have seen it as our place where culture happens. I, I always have talked about this for years that nobody else on earth celebrates culture in restaurants the way we do. We do birthdays and anniversaries and weddings and important meetings and family reunions in restaurants the way nobody else on earth does. People do those things at home in most other parts of the world. Even Europe, people do those things at home. We do them in the restaurant. Uh, the restaurant is to us what the plaza is to Spanish speaking countries. We, the restaurant is our communal space. And so extending that to the public space, commandeering sidewalks and streets to allow for that community gathering in a way that might also actually reduce, have some good environmental consequences as well in, in reducing car traffic. Um, all of that could be part of, an, of, of a city's overall vision for more public space, more communal gathering, less uh, environmental footprint, um, more of an ab ability for people to gather publicly. So I, I think restaurants of the future could look like a lot of different things, hopefully more equitable, you know, perhaps beyond the four walls, uh, offering people retail and at-home opportunities to cook, the meal kits, 
Um, and the most important thing, maybe one of the most important things beyond the worker piece, is the ability for people of different classes and races to come together in ways that we haven't seen in the restaurant industry to date. We have a very segregated restaurant industry. I mean, in, not just in terms of workers, but also in terms of consumer dining. And so could we see restaurants that were catering to a certain upscale clientele of one race now opening themselves up to people of many different races, many different kinds? Sorry, we got a question from Jordan that uh, is a good one. Jordan writes, the actions recommended in the book to address these inequities with restaurant workers are collective responses. Are there things we can do as individuals, we've mentioned tipping, or is it best to find a collective with which to take action? What's the best way to get involved? So is there anything individuals can do? And I know you've written before about being a responsible diner, about when you go out, think about where you're going and, and yes. in a way that helps workers. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I, I so appreciate the question because I think the moment is calling for both. I think that everybody absolutely has the power to dine in ways that support equity. So right now, US consumers have even more power than you did before um, because restaurants are worried about consumers coming back. Restaurants are having these conversations, will diners come back? And so you as diners have the ability to ask every time you eat out, you know, how are people paid? <laughs> um, do people get benefits here? Do people get hazard pay? Uh, you know, is there PPE? Uh, what kind of safety protocols are put in place? Um, you can look at a dining floor and see how diverse the staff is. In most fine dining restaurants, you'll see white people serving in the front, people of color in the kitchen. You can say, I, as a consumer, would like to see more people of color in the dining floor. I know where that's where the livable wage jobs are. You have the power to ask these questions and push because restaurants are worried about whether you will come back. So I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask. I'd like to ask those questions, but I probably would want to be seated, you know, and, and have, have a nice <laughs> dinner whenever we do get back to restaurants. So, so, so is there anyone? Is there anyone who actually asks restaurants that evaluates restaurants based on some of those safety questions that you had before? Sort of a blue yeah. book for is this restaurant treating its workers well? Yes, we've done that. It's called the ROC National Diners Guide. There are some Seattle restaurants that get gold and silver stars in the guide, but we didn't create the guide to just have you just choose one restaurant over the other. We actually created it as a tool for you to have these conversations wherever you ate out because frankly, there are not enough gold and silver star winners in the guide for you to only eat at those places. What's more effective for you as an individual consumer is to eat out wherever you're gonna eat out and ask these questions because asking the questions actually creates change. It isn't just about asking to know whether you should eat there. It's asking the question so that the employer knows you are paying attention to those issues. And we saw this happen on local and organic. Work, consumers asking is this local or organic actually did lead to restaurants changing their menus and their sourcing practices. So we know asking these questions is a big deal. But I do wanna say to Jordan, I couldn't agree with the question more that yes, we can do individual things, but collect, like this is a moment for, if there was ever a moment for collective action, it is now. We have the power as workers and consumers to change. And, and let's, we've been talking a lot about small and medium sized businesses. Let's talk about big business. Let's talk about chains. We have the potential to collectively call on the chains to do things differently. We saw this with the pandemic. Darden is the world's largest full service restaurant company. They own Olive Garden and Red Lobster and many other brands. And fought us for years on paid sick leave and suddenly overnight announced that they were giving all of their workers paid sick leave during the pandemic. It is possible to change even the most recalcitrant, you know, um, very, very stubborn large businesses and get them to do what we want because there's power to do that right now as consumers. So if we can act collectively through efforts like ours. We've created something called Diners United, which is a consumer association for consumers to speak up and be able to say, we don't want this and we want this and have some impact. You mentioned some questions we should ask and I wonder if you could just kind of yeah. boil that down for us. I walk into the restaurant, I kind of would like to eat, that's why I'm there. But what, what, are, <laughs> what are some very quick questions I should make sure to ask? And should I be asking the wait staff or should I be saying, could I speak to yeah. the owner for a minute? Who should I talk should to? Speak to the owner or the managers, get, yeah. sit down, 
sit down or get your food if you're doing takeout. After you've gotten your food, ask to speak to the owner or the manager. Say, I ex appreciated my experience here. I appreciated the service staff. They were great. The food was great. I want to appreciate the back of the house. But I want you to know as a consumer that I make my choices in terms of dining in terms of the following criteria. <laughs> One, wages and benefits. I want to know that everybody's getting a livable wage, both the front and the back. I want to know that there's equity between front and back. I want you to know that I value equity. Uh, two, mobility and racial segregation. I want you to know that I value seeing people of color in higher level positions and women in higher level positions. And three, benefits and safety. I want you to know that I value restaurants that provide paid leave, good paid leave policies and have health benefits and provide hazard pay and sick pay, particularly in this moment. And I want to know what your safety protocols are with regard to per personal protective equipment and all of those things. So, so I think just naming three categories in particular, wage and tip compensation, mobility and racial equity, and health and safety issues, those three things are really the key issues right now for workers and three things you could elevate as a consumer. Uh, speaking of, uh, of of tips, we got this question from Fasuki who says, I know some restaurants have moved to a fixed service charge model instead of tipping. Is this an approach that can spread to many most restaurants to guarantee a fair wage to workers? First of all, uh, the assumption that a service charge guarantees a fair wage for workers, is that correct? It really depends on the restaurant. <laughs> and this is why you have to ask questions. Um, you know, unless they're very transparent about what they're doing with that service charge on the menu, uh, most of the country service charges can be actually fully appropriated by the employers. And so it's not 100% guaranteed that all of that money goes to the workers. And you have to ask and push and say, how is this money distributed, spent? What happens to the service charge here? Because it's it, in some restaurants, certainly there are great restaurants around the country that are using service charges the right way, using it to raise workers' wages, using it to create equitable systems of gratuity distribution between front and back. Some employers are taking large portions of those service charge for the business or management, and you've got to ask. You know, I wonder that if that's a good question too. Are are the tips being shared with the back of the of the building, being shared with the dishwashers and others? Yes. I mean, a lot of these things we're talking about um, that provide workers with better working conditions and better pay come apart come because of unions. And I was asking you beforehand, I, I couldn't think of any place aside from Las Vegas that had unionized restaurant workers. And you said, yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm wondering if this, if this moment, if this crisis moment opens the opportunity for people to organize, because we've seen time and time again that that actually really improves workers if they're able to organize in some way, shape, or form. Are there any options yes. there? Yes, I was describing them earlier. This is the moment for workers to come together and go to their and go to their boss collectively and say, "We're not coming back until we see X, Y, and Z." And we have power because we can let the regulars know that we don't have these things. And it doesn't even have to be done in a in a in a negative way. It can be simply the power of workers coming together and saying, "We need X, Y, and Z." Let's work together and get those things so that we can come back to work safely and in a stable work environment. So yes, this is the moment where workers can come together and have more leverage than usual and form worker organizations, whether you want to call them unions or they're just worker associations in the workplace. This is the moment for people to use that National Labor Relations Act that passed that gives workers the right to come together and you don't even have to form a union. The, the right is simply to come together and speak collectively and not get retaliated against when you speak collectively. That's really hard. How do you get people who maybe just are making ends meet take the extra time to go to a meeting and organize themselves? And in some ways, it seems like unions make that a bit easier. They provide the organizing heft for it, then workers pay their dues to keep that organizing effort going. <laughs> That's true, uh, but in this moment, we have seen lots of self-organizing, lots and lots of self-organizing where workers are just taking the initiative, especially people are at home right now. They haven't gone back quite yet everywhere, and there are lots of people who are unemployed and not going back, as we talked about, 
And so there are large numbers of people who have some ability right now to get on a phone call with their fellow workers and say, we need to call the boss together and say, we need X, Y, and Z before we come back. So I do think, yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a piece of survival, but there's also a much higher level of frustration and a much higher level, a, a lot of awakening among workers that they're just not willing to put up with the kinds of things that they, were, they put up with before because their eyes have been opened to the fact that this was not sustainable, this was not the right way. And there is power right now because consumers are watching. We have a ask a question button down below. If you have a question for Saru, please ask it. Um, I, I, I'm wondering about, is there anyone to help workers who don't necessarily have a union they can affiliate with, but just would like to do it on their own? Is there any, are there any resources they can go to, to to kind of get them leveraged to going forward? Thank you so much for asking that. Um, so we have created a fund. It's the OFWEmergencyFund.org. And through that fund, we are collectivizing workers' voices from around the country. 175,000 workers have come to us through the fund. We have raised $23 million to hand out cash payments to these workers. And we're using that interaction to actually also provide workers with all kinds of support, legal counseling, other counseling, and training for how to organize. And a training for in their rights when they want to organize. So people can go to ofwemergencyfund.org and click on questions and say, I want to know how I can do this in my workplace, and we will provide that help to do that. I want to return to something you touched upon earlier, and that's um, the unemployment benefits that many workers are not getting. You've written, unemployment insurance is a broken system processed through state systems. They're using antiquated technology and were designed to deny claimants. I yes. want you to expand upon that. It's so, I'm so glad you asked that because it's a history that, like the tip minimum wage, most people don't know. So the New Deal, so many people are comparing this moment to the Great Depression and the opportunity to pass something like the New Deal now. The New Deal, though, uh, it, it was when we got the right to organize and the right to minimum wage, but it had its problems. One was that it excluded tipped workers, who are largely black women at the time. Another was that it really created unemployment insurance from the get-go as a system that was set up intentionally to deny people benefits because the idea was we need to get people willing to take any low-wage job that's out there uh, and, and therefore set up unemployment insurance so that you lose your benefits unless you are willing to take any work that comes your way. In other words, when you get benefits, you sign up for basically the agreement, the contract you sign is, I will take anything that comes my way and I lose my benefits if I'm not willing to take anything that comes on. So it was set up intentionally to deny. Uh, it was set up intentionally to be hard to access because they didn't want people from the very beginning to not be willing to take the lowest wage jobs possible. And that, that is, by the way, the rhetoric you're hearing right now from Republicans in the Senate. Why would we offer people $600 stimulus or you know unemployment? Maybe they'll not want to go back to work because it's more than what they're earning. There are two ways to think about that. One is, oh no, we're worried people won't go back to work if they get $600. The other is raise people's freaking wages so that they make more than $600. You know, um, you know, they're they're clearly people aren't earning enough if six hundred dollars would keep them from going to work. Um, so we we have the opportunity now to push back on something that was wrong to begin with, because I think so many people are talking about unemployment insurance as the savior. Even some of the folks on the left are saying the federal government needs to put more money into unemployment insurance, not understanding that all unemployment insurance, even at the federal level, everything that Congress has passed, even the good stuff, is all being funneled through state unemployment insurance systems that were set up to deny people and that are set up on antiquated technology. You know, some of these people have systems set up in the 60s and 70s that are completely broken. So we did a, a national analysis state by state. We found that 44% of all applicants nationally across the country for unemployment insurance have not gotten benefits, have been denied. Almost half, and a good half of the states, it's 
very low. So we've got states like South Dakota has a 7% approval rate. 7 93% of applicants have not gotten unemployment insurance. Florida, 33% unemployment insurance rate. So I do have Washington specific data. Washington is better than Florida and South Dakota. You're at 60 60%, 60 percent of applicants getting unemployment insurance. But that's 40% of people who have still not gotten their unemployment insurance. 40%. And so you when you're running everything through state systems that were set up to deny, you realize this is not the system we should be looking at anyway. What we really need is what your amazing congresswoman has proposed, Pramila J. Paul, which is a paycheck guarantee program. That's what we really need. That would not be run through the states. Um, that would guarantee people continued income, even in a pandemic like this. Unemployment insurance was set up intentionally to deny and throwing more money at it is not fixing the problem. And let me just give you one example of that real quick. We've heard from a number of workers who were denied by their state unemployment insurance systems because they didn't meet the minimum threshold to qualify. They were too poor to qualify. Then they applied for the federal because they heard PUA was supposed to get them money when their states denied them. PUA is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. So they got approved by the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, but they couldn't access the money because the state it has, still comes to the same state system and they were told the state has to reverse your denial in order for you to get the federal money. And they had to wait weeks and weeks and weeks for old state systems to reverse their denial. So it's not working. Well, um, that makes me wonder whether states are the place to do this. And that gets to a question that Caroline asked, what regulations should be in place coming from the federal government so there's uniform equity for all of us instead of locality by locality, state by state? <laughs> this is the million dollar question, right? Because if we had a leader who was worried about our health, truly, uh, or somebody who cared about ending the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic. Let's imagine we, we do. <laughs> imagine we do. <laughs> um, we, would have, we would have contact tracing. We would have testing. We would have safety protocols before anybody reopens anywhere. We would have universal health care, <laughs> right? We would have the things we all know we need to, to come your, back safely. To your last point, will we have the federal government handing out unemployment checks? Would we centralize it that way so that it's uniform and fairer, more equitable? Yeah, I mean, maybe in, in a future world where if we had a government, if we had a Senate and a president that believed in that, you could have the federal government handing out unemployment the way they're handing out stimulus, right? But uh, the, the problem is still that um, it can't be based on your income. There's so many problems with unemployment insurance. It can, if it's based on your income, you're still gonna have the poorest among us suffering. It's gotta be universal. That $600 has gotta be universal regardless of how much you earn, universal to every applicant, and maybe coming from the federal government or a command from the state from the federal government to the states. But I really do think I agree with Pramila that really what we need is a paycheck guarantee program. And that's a bigger, longer term solution. Is there anything that can be done immediately for all these people who are not able to get unemployment benefits? It's just stalled at the state level. The numbers you mentioned are staggering. Is there anything yeah. short of a giant change in the system to make that happen? I mean, that's why we created our fund. We've been getting out payments of $500 to workers, trying to raise more money to get them more and using that money as an opportunity to organize people for change. We've been doing large tele-town halls. We did one with Jay Paul. We did one with Senator Harris. We did, we're did. doing one with Cory Booker tomorrow um, and allowing workers who are getting these resources to also raise their voices and say, this system isn't working. So the short term, I think we need to support these workers through immediate relief, but but I keep calling it shaping relief in a way that shapes the future. Let's provide relief to work to workers in a way that brings them together and allows them to collectivize their voices. Let's provide relief to employers in a way that conditions that relief on greater equity, higher wages, everything we really need. We got this question from Thomas who asks, since so many restaurant workers are undocumented. How can you reach them since they live in perpetual fear? First of all, are many restaurant workers document, undocumented? Well, uh, it depends on the region, but in regions like Seattle and Los Angeles and the Bay Area, Chicago, New York, 
um, we're looking at you know anywhere from a third to 40 percent of uh, restaurant workers being undocumented even if they're documented by the way most documented workers right now if they're in process are not documented immigrants are not applying for benefits because in under this administration they'd be seen as a public charge if they took unemployment insurance um, so it doesn't matter at this moment if you're documented or undocumented you're kind of screwed when it comes to benefits and so that's why the relief programs we've been setting up have been actually targeting undocumented workers and other immigrants for cash relief, legal support, financial counseling, anything else that we can provide. Um, we've been reaching them through Spanish speaking media. We've been reaching them online. We've been reaching them through word of mouth um, and through employers, scrupulous employers who actually care about their workers are having their undocumented folks who are laid off apply to our fund. Again, though, power, safety in numbers, it really is about coming together and yes, getting resources, helping each other, and then also fighting for change. Sarah, I'm kind of curious, uh, just for a moment, your, why your personal passion for restaurant workers? I understand your family ran restaurants, is that true? Yes. Uh, my, so how, how, did you, how did you get interested in taking this up as a cause? What got you personally involved in it? Yeah. Well, my grandparents, yes, ran restaurants in India, um, but my family immigrated to India right before I was born. And uh, it started, for me, it started as a passion of working with immigrant workers. And then 9-11 happened. And on September 11th, there was a restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center, Tower One in New York City, called Windows on the World. On that, mo on that morning of 9-11, 73 workers died in the restaurant. And another 13,000 workers lost their jobs in New York City. It was actually a moment eerily similar to this one. Um, it was one place, so it's very different because this is national, this is global. But in that moment, thousands of workers were out of work, people had died, people were not eating out, and we were trying to reconstruct people's lives, and we built the Restaurant Opportunity Center out of the ashes of tragedy. And, and it really proves that you can organize in a, in a moment like this. You know, um, we've been recently watching a lot of videos about uh, strikes and actions during the Great Depression, and they had a they had a motto: "Fight, don't starve. Fight, don't starve." You know, um, that's that is that is that is the potential here as well. So it was 9/11, a similar moment to this, that allowed us to start this movement that made me realize I just can't imagine doing anything else because this is the nation's largest and fastest growing industry with the lowest wages. It's the epitome of our incredibly unequal society and it's so to me i can't think of a better way to fight inequality than to change the restaurant industry um but it but it just shows that this is a moment of opportunity this is a moment of horrible crisis and a moment of incredible opportunity marion nessel who wrote the introduction to your book talks about the capitalist system as kind of being the core issue here do you agree Yes. <laughs> yes. Capitalism, at least the way it operates in the United States, uh, is not, it's not really true capitalism. It's not a free market. I mean, we see this with the National Restaurant Association. They are an oligopoly. They have done price fixing. They have essentially come together as all of the chains and determined that the wage in this country for workers is going to be $2.13 an hour. They have come together and wielded unbridled power over both Democrats and Republicans in the United States, that they get to set the wages and working conditions in this country. Um, also, there's a reverence for employers that we don't extend to workers. And, you know, it's funny when you think about your favorite restaurants and how amazing they are, you think about the chef, you think about the owner. I, I've seen just countless op-eds and news stories by amazing chefs and restaurant owners lamenting the, you know, thinking about the future of the industry, I've not seen one story written by a worker, except for the things we've put in forward, you know, saying, recognizing workers' value and worth in providing you with those meals. So I think both culturally and politically, the way capitalism has infiltrated our society, and most of all, the way in which 
It controls our democracy. Most of all, corporate control of our democracy. That is the greatest problem we are facing right now. And that is what we could overturn. That is what we as a people could say, enough is enough. Corporate control of our democracy is not the way capitalism should be operating. It is not efficient, healthy, sustainable, and we're seeing it with this pandemic. When US green forces you to reopen, when people are dying, you have to say enough is enough. The, there are other capitalist systems besides what we have in the US. When you look abroad, do you see other capitalist systems that are doing a better job for the inequities Absolutely. that you look at? Absolutely, look, I mean, you can look, everybody talks about Europe. <laughs> um, there are other places as well where you can see communities thriving. I, I like to look at Kerala in, in India, which is, um, you know, it was a communist state, but it but it functions in many ways with capitalism. It's hard to, to not in this day and age, even if you are supposedly a communist state. You know, you have 90% literacy in Kerala. You, people are fed. Everybody's getting tested. There's contact tracing in Kerala, India, <laughs> which oh, we don't I, have I, in the United States. I didn't know what Kerala is. Kerala a state in India? I, I'm not Kerala sure. is a state in India, the southernmost tip of India that has long has had a long communist history. Now I would call it more of a social democracy, um, and uh, and and it's just put so much emphasis on education and equality and. And like now, health, God forbid. <laughs> um, and so, but Europe, Europe, I think maybe is an easier comparison for a lot of Americans. You know, restaurant workers in Scandinavia earn $21 an hour. Um, that's before tips. Tipping is not minimal because workers are paid a professional livable wage by their employer. Um, and it was interesting, there was an article in the New York Times like maybe five years ago about why workers are paid $21 an hour in Denmark. And somebody interviewed the person who oversees all the restaurants in the Copenhagen airport and asked him, why do you pay workers $21 an hour? And he said, well, if we didn't, then they would have to rely on public assistance and that would be the sign of a failed society. And um, I think that points to what we've got here. Uh, Dale has a question along these lines about how other countries are dealing with this issue. He writes, France has a higher wage and no tips. Is that something the U.S. could model? Yeah, it's so important to know that history, by the way. Um, so tipping originated in Europe, as I said. It came to the States in the 1850s because rich Americans started to travel to Europe and come back and show off that they knew the rules of Europe. And there was actually a populist movement in the United States rejecting tipping as a vestige of feudalism. Americans said, we are a democracy. We expect employers to pay workers, not customers. You should get good service regardless of how much you can afford to tip. And Alexis de Tocqueville came to the United States around that time, wrote about American democracy and said, America is such a great democracy, there's no tipping. And that populist movement resulted in six states passing complete bans, prohibitions on tipping. And that populist movement that started in America spread to Europe and the labor movement picked it up in Europe with the rallying cry of, we are professionals. We don't live off of your tips. We need professional incomes from our bosses. And that is why in Europe today, you see that it is truly a profession. You go to hospitality school for many years to be a hospitality professional. These don't, these don't have to be throwaway, unskilled jobs. These are high-skilled jobs with low wages in the United States. And they're high-skilled professions in Europe because how they're of how they're remunerated and compensated. And so Europe got rid of it based on a movement that started here that was unfortunately quashed because of slavery, because of our ugly racial history where the industry decided, well, we can just hire black people and not pay them anything. They haven't been paid after all for generations. Let them live on tips. That is how our system came about. You know, talking about Europe, I got a chance to look at the way that Germany integrates labor and business and, and government and creates jobs, creates training for everyone. You mentioned the professionalization of jobs we think of as just job jobs, that you get a certificate to work as a clerk in a store. I'm sure that it involves the restaurant industry also, and it guarantees yeah. you a certain level. You can go anywhere in Germany, I think many places in Europe with that certificate. Okay. And it's because of this kind of unheard of cooperation between unions and business and government that we don't see here. They're always That's fighting right. one another. It's based on a notion called sectoral bargaining, 
where workers in a lot of Europe have sector-wide unions. They're not unions based on a workplace. They're national unions of workers that then create what are called ILAs, industry labor agreements, where you've got a whole sector of workers negotiating with a whole sector of employers and government. So it's workers, employers, and the government sitting down at the table and determining what the wages are going to be, what the training is going to be, what the wage progression is going to be, how you move up. So, I mean, what is a profession? Truly, what is a profession? A profession is something in which you, first, it's a career. It's something you dedicate your life to because you see the ability to move up a ladder. Because in a profession, you see the ability to, you know, say, I could, I see the opportunity to move up, to get more certification, to actually get, to actually get a higher wage, to have more responsibility and autonomy. If you don't see that progression, you're not going to see it as a career. You're not going to see it as a profession. Um, there are millions of workers in our industry, in the restaurant industry in the United States, that love what they do, that take great pride. This is not a default job for the majority of workers in our industry. But they're not treated as professionals. They're not allowed to see that wage progression or that pathway to something better. And those are the things that when the industry reinvents itself, it's got to reinvent itself to create real ladders that allow people to see this as a profession. And what's the payoff for the employers? Far less turnover. We have the highest rates of turnover of any industry in the United States. And we've proven that you can cut your employee turnover in half by paying them more and allowing them to see a pathway to move up. See, I've never understood that because a good capitalist looks at the bottom line and looks at ways yeah. to maximize investment and the turnover issue that you just mentioned, it, it doesn't seem like it would require an outside source. If you're a smart business person, you know that you keep people from turning over. I don't understand it. I mean, but there are good business owners. Don't get me wrong. Renee Erickson is one of them. Danny Meyer is another. I mean, people who really see the best way for me to succeed over the long term is to invest in my people. Um, the problem is really the chains. The chains set the standard in our industry, even if a lot of independent restaurants in Seattle would really say, I'm totally wrong. No, they set their own standards. Chains don't set the standards. The truth is the chains have really created the mythology in the United States that you have to keep your labor costs at a certain level. You can't exceed that. You shouldn't invest in these ways. Um, they have really created that mythology. and. It is just that. It is mythology because when you look at the true bottom line, if you invest in your people, you will see long-term returns. The problem in our country is that the way shareholder publicly traded companies are set up, they look at quarterly returns. They don't look at returns over six months or a year, and so they're not able to see the payoff of really investing in your people. You mentioned the chains, and uh, you talked earlier about the other NRA, the National Restaurant Association as kind of suppressing a lot of worker issues in this. What have they been talking about in the last few months? Oh, it's so repulsive. <laughs> because on the one hand, I told you some of them, some of the chains have had to change their ways, like Darden suddenly flipped after years of being vitriolically opposed, funding the opposition on paid sick leave, suddenly offered paid sick leave to all of its workers. But the truth is that what they've really been doing is colluding with their BFF, Donald Trump, who's a member, card-carrying member of the National Restaurant Association, to get as much money as they possibly can out of our taxpayer dollars. So a lot of them got PPE in the tens of millions of dollars. And what's so repulsive and disgusting is that they got tens of millions of dollars in our taxpayer money, PPE, while at the same time their employees were being told that their tax earned unemployment insurance would not be coming to them because they were paid too little because of a system that those same companies that got tens of millions of dollars set up to pay those workers two dollars and 13 cents an hour so they're getting tens of million dollars their employees are getting nothing nothing and uh the way ppe was set up which was so disgusting. They called it a small business program, but they set it up so that large chains could qualify because of the number of employees in a particular establishment. Um, so very sneaky. Um, and then on top of that, they've been crying to Donald Trump that they still don't have enough and Donald Trump is giving them money. I don't know if any of you had a chance to hear or watch or 
find out about this meeting that Donald Trump had with restaurant owner leaders last week. It's the meeting where he announced that he's now taking hydroxychloroquine or that he just ended his dose. <laughs> yeah, that was the lead on that. That was the lead on that event. But what else happened? That was the lead on that event. But what that event really was, wasn't about him taking hydroxychloroquine. It was a meeting of him with restaurant leaders. And in that meeting, there was a major chain, owner of a major chain, Landry's. I, I don't, you don't say owner in a publicly traded company. It's the CEO of a major chain, Landry's, which owns a lot of very low-end restaurants. Um, saying, you know, small businesses aren't the only ones that's suffering. We corporate chains, we're really suffering and we need help. And in that meeting, Donald Trump turns to him and says, okay, we'll do something for you. <laughs> turns out later, people found out they're, they're personal friends. So um, they are recouping. I mean, they're just, they're really doing very well for themselves right now while their workers are struggling. And these are the kinds of things we must collectively call out. Sarah, I'm really enjoying our conversation. We're getting to the end of our hour, though. I would like to get to a question from Alan, and then uh, Candace is going to come in and, and do a benediction for us. But Alan writes, he's been a he's been a restaurant worker his entire life, and he says capitalism still demands inherent exploitation to function. All those more equal and equitable European nations are only able to do that because of past and present violent exploitation of the global South. He writes, I think that in order to ultimately address the inequity being talked about tonight, we need to look at it and think about systems change in a broad global context. Do you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, doesn't the pandemic show us we live in a global context and that everything that happens elsewhere impacts us here? So that's absolutely true. And again, I'm going to repeat, if there's ever been a moment to really upend those kinds of huge structural impediments, huge structural problems, it is now because we have been, we have seen with our own eyes how what happens to people in China and India and Brazil impacts us here in the United States. It even impacts the 1%. And so this is our moment to call for truly, true reinvention and reimagination of not just the restaurant industry, but our entire world. If you want to find out more, buy the book. It's right down there. Click on it, and you can find out much more from this book that uh, Saru helped to edit. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this evening. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for the conversation. You bet. Yeah, thank you both so much. Um, Saru, thank you for your expertise and um, your urgency. This is a topic that just affects so many of us. I really appreciate hearing um, that everything you know, you have so much knowledge on this, it's so <laughs> eye-opening. Um, and Ross, thank you for your expert moderating. Um, and thank you all for watching. If you would like to see more town hall content, you can click on the follow button at the top right corner of your screen. Um, if you're feeling generous tonight, you can donate using the donate button at the bottom of the screen. And um, as Ross said, please buy the book by through the buy the book button here. Um, that'll take you to our partner bookseller um, so you can shop local. Um, thank you all so much again and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.